Hi, okay, so welcome to Retech, and today we're going to continue with our computer history series. And it's quite an in depth series, and there's a lot to cover. But in this episode, we're going to cover somebody who is often forgotten about in the annals of computer science and very much forgotten about when you take him into account of the Alan Turing effect and also Maurice Wilkes, which we discussed in a previous episode. Now, we, as I said before, Maurice Wilkes was kind of the architect towards the modern computers and with these EDZAC and later LEO computers, and they were all based around the EDZAC machine. Now, what most people don't know is that there was another person in the mix, and um, that person was called Douglas Hartree. And Douglas Hartree, for want of a better term, was a mentor for Maurice Wilkes. And without Douglas, Maurice would probably never have gone down the route of designing and coming up with what we know now as EDZAC. Now, with all these stories, we have um, a link, a link between a lot of people around at a very similar time in a similar area. Now, the link is the city and the universities, and that is Cambridge, but the link between the people goes even further forward than even Mr. Hartree, because Douglas Hartree obviously knew Morris Wilkes, and Morris Wilkes knew Alan Turing, and as we said before in our previous videos, they, they possibly didn't see eye to eye at times. Uh, of course, I did not go along with his ideas about computer architecture, exactly, uh, and I thought that the programming system that he introduced at Manchester University was bizarre in the extreme. <laughs> But as uh, Morris put it, it was an amicable kind of relationship between them, both of them. But it's kind of part of the course when you get minds who are generally thinking in the similar direction, kind of bouncing off of each other. And that happens everywhere. But Douglas Hartree and Maurice Wilkes were kind of intertwined in the EDZAC period. And as I said, without Douglas, you wouldn't really have the machine that we now know as EDZAC, which then went on to produce the Lions machine. But it runs even further than that, because intertwined within these three people, we have somebody who's still very much in the computing scene today, and that is Andrew Herbert, who became director for Microsoft's European and Asian divisions. And as we can see, there's been a long period of people intertwining and combining with each other to bring us to where we are today with our modern computers. So today we're going to take a look at Douglas Hartree. Then in the next episode, we're going to move on to Andrew Herbert and how he shaped things, not only for Microsoft, but in his previous career. So let's take a look at a person who helped shape computer history and also shape where we are today with our technology. And that person is Douglas Hartree. So Douglas Rayner Hartree was born March 27, 1897, and he survived until 12th of February 1958 is when he sadly passed away. And he was an English mathematician. He was also quite famous for atomic physics and the construction of a differential analyzer using believe it or not, Meccano. Now, Douglas was born in Cambridge in England, and his father was William, who was also a lecturer in engineering at Cambridge University. And his mother was 
president of the National Council of Women and also mayor of the city of Cambridge. He was the oldest of three sons that survived infancy. A brother and sister died in infancy when he was still a child, but his two brothers would later also die. Hartree's seven-year-old brother John Edwin died when Hartree was 17, and his 22-year-old brother Colin died from meningitis in February 1920 when Hartree was only 23. He had quite a sad start in life and there was obviously you know a lot of turmoil and pain within his early years. Now Hartree attended St John's College in Cambridge but with the First World War looming and it also interrupted his studies and he joined a group working on anti-aircraft ballistics. This is where he gained considerable skill and an abiding interest in practical calculations. And differential equations was one of his specialities. It was basically his kind of motivation for his mathematics. But he executed most of his own work with pencil and paper. But after the end of World War I, Hartree returned to Cambridge, graduating in 1922 with a second class degree in natural sciences. It was 1929 when Hartree was at the University of Manchester. He visited the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and this is where he learned about a differential analyzer and that's what spurred his resolve into actually creating one when he got back to Manchester and he set about building his own analyzer from Meccano and using that analyzer he saw the potential for further exploiting his numeracy methods using this machine and he persuaded Sir Robert McDougall to find a more robust machine which was built in collaboration with Metropolitan Vickers. Now the first application of this machine kind of reflected Hartree's enthusiasm for the railways and it was used for calculating timetables for the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. And basically he spent the rest of a decade applying the differential analyzer to different problems to find different solutions arising in physics. And these included control theory, boundary layer theory and fluid dynamics. And each time he used his machine, it made a significant contribution to each of the fields. Now, in the Second World War, Hartree supervised two computing groups. Now, the first group was for the Ministry of Supply, and it was basically a job shop for solutions of differential equations. And the differential analyzer at Manchester University was the only full-sized eight integer differential analyzer in the country. But it, it all kind of changed in 1945 when he went on a two month tour of computing installations in the USA and that included visiting ENIAC which was still not complete but he kind of came acquainted with the drafts of von Neumann's EDVAC report in 1945. And about two months later, he also went over to see ENIAC, but at the time the machine wasn't publicly known. So in February 1946, Max Newman, who'd been involved in the Colossus computer, which is, you know, one of Turing's projects, submitted an application to the Royal Society for funds to start building a general purpose computer at the University of Manchester. And this is where Douglas Hartree kind of got intertwined with Maurice Wilkes and the funding was given on Hartree's recommendation that the country needed a machine which could serve the interests of the country but it was opposed by Darwin but eventually Hartree got it through and won the day and um, that's where the developments in Manchester University started. And it was at this point at the end of 1945 that Hartree briefed Maurice Wilkes um, about the developments that were happening in the USA. And then Wilkes received an invitation from the Moore School of Electrical Engineering to attend the course on computers. But his brief was really for him to 
find out as much as he could about ENIAC with the intention of building a version of his own. Now, Hartree worked closely with Wilkes throughout the mid-1940s and they developed EDZAC and um, it basically became the world's first true computer and it was the world's first Turing complete computer as Turing would have seen it because it was effectively a multi-purpose machine. After this Hartree returned to Cambridge to take up the post of plumber professor of mathematical physics in 1946 and he gave a lecture on calculating machines. Hartree saw the need for use of subroutines within this and that's part of his lecture and he basically ended taking a look at what computers might do and basically he stated that he understood that many problems of economic, medical and sociological interests and importance await study which cannot be undertaken at present because of the formidable load of computing involved. And later on in November 1946 he did an interview with the Daily Telegraph and he quoted saying the implications of the machine are so vast that we cannot conceive how they will affect our civilization. This he was referring to Edzak. Here you have something which is making one field of human activity 1,000 times faster. In the field of transportation it's equivalent to the ability to travel from London to Cambridge in five seconds as a regular thing. He then all went on to say that it was almost unimaginable and he was right because before this time it would have been unimaginable for a machine to do the calculations that Edzak was doing in 1946. Hartree's final major project was the contribution to um, British computing again and it started in early 1947 and that was for J. Lyons and Co. And that was basically an implementation of EDSAC and it became a workhorse computer for a company. So it was one of the first commercial applications of a computer. And that machine became known as LEO. As a statement of how important Hartree was to the headquarters of Lyons, that they renamed their headquarters as Hartree House. And this really underlines the extent to which Lyons felt that Hartree contributed to their venture. But there's one quote from Hartree which is kind of at odds to where we are today because in around about 1950 he basically did an estimate of how many computers you need within the UK and his estimate was we have a computer here in Cambridge, one in Manchester, one at the NPL and um, I suppose there ought to be one in Scotland but that's about all. He didn't see any more requirement for computers within a country than the four including a one that was never built at the time in Scotland. So four machines in the entire country is what Hartree thought was all we needed. And that's how things have changed. Now a lot of people have four computers to a household or more. And it's just commonplace. It's something that almost everybody has. So Hartree's contribution to the computing world was huge because without Hartree you wouldn't have had Ed Zach. Morris Wilkes wouldn't have been known, you would never have had the Lions computer and you would never have had any of the spin-offs after it. And without Morris Wilkes you wouldn't have had the person we're going to look at next and a person who ended up taking a major role at a major software company in the world. 
So that's a brief look at somebody who's been often forgotten in the annals of computer history, and that's Douglas Hartree. He was a major player, I mean, a huge player, and without him, we wouldn't be where we are today. And um, it's kind of nice to see everything link up together. And it kind of gathered around a core of people who made these things work. You had Charles Babbage initially, but it was more theoretical. You had Alan Turing, who was both theoretical and practical. But then you had Morris Wilkes and Douglas Hartree, who were eminently practical, could put their ideas and make it work in the physical. And that's how we got from the early machines, such as EDZAC, to the machines we have today. So I hope you enjoyed this um, small look at somebody who should and deserves more praise and more recognition than he gets. And I hope this kind of goes a little bit towards that. So thanks for watching and I hope you subscribe if you enjoyed this and there's more to come. So thank you.